So first of all, welcome back. Second, happy birthday to Jeremy. Third, I'm very happy to report that I'm finally caught up on posting slides and videos for the class. I was, I don't know, more than a week behind. I don't even remember anymore. But finally, finally, I was able to do this. So now if you check the website, which you should always check, um, you will see uh, all the slide decks and all the readings uh, and all the videos and sort of annotations on the readings, kind of you know, describing why I included those readings and sort of what I hope to get out of it. So as usual, I guess some of you are asking before about more guidance on, on readings. So, so typically the way the class has worked so far is um, I read all these things and prepare a lecture, kind of summarizing things that I learned from all of these readings. Uh, and obviously the lecture is just a summary. So you know, if you wanna get the full uh, set of details and depth about all of the things we end up covering in lecture, I encourage you to go check out the actual readings. Uh, and the readings I cite in the lecture, there's always at least the slide at the end with all the things that I, I used as materials for that lecture. Uh, and I post the actual PDFs and whatnot of those things in that shared Google Drive folder. So it's easy for you all to find them. Uh, and I annotate the website, the web page for that class on the website with some uh, notes about to, you know, why that reading was useful and important and sort of, you know, so to help you more easily find the right things to read. So you know, hopefully you get a chance to read more about all the things we talk about in class uh, on your own using these readings. You're of course, welcome to read other things as well in addition to these. There's no, uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Now, I, ideally, I would have asked you to read all of these readings before class and we, you know, we had more time to discuss the readings together and whatnot, but I uh, rarely uh, have uh, enough lead time to have all of these ready to give you enough time to read them before class. I, I can't obviously ask you to read all these things like a day before class or something. So, so that's why we're sort of doing it post hoc rather than, than, than pre-class, which would have been better, I think, but you know, next time uh, we're all learning. Uh, okay, so some, some announcements or, or administrative things. One, the, um, the big thing for the class, I hope you remember is the research project report. Um, so what I was gonna do, um, I think one of you, or, was Nadia maybe uh, asking for more guidance on this? What I was gonna do is dig up some old reports that students have submitted in the class in previous semesters. Uh, and so show you, share those with you as examples of kind of what I'm expecting uh, out of this um, to, to give you more guidance. So, so there was a question from someone the other day about so what's the difference between this kickoff presentation that you gave, I don't know, a few weeks ago and the final report that I hope to see from you in, in May, um, the difference is about five to 10 pages of text, basically. Um, so I sort of, the, so yes, it's okay if the final deliverable is still a, a research proposal, proposal in the sense that, you know, maybe you haven't had time to actually do all this research and report on the actual results. That's okay, I understand that. But I, I would like the write up to sort of be of you know, enough maturity and quality to, um, to pass as an actual uh, research paper, should you turn this into a research paper, which I hope you will. Um, so that said, you know, like proper uh, use of language and citations and text and so on, and like a, an actual write up, like you would write for a research paper. Uh, and I'll, I'll share examples of what the students have done in the past to give you more guidance on that. Uh, okay, the other thing, so that's one. Um, the other thing, I uh, realized that some of you might benefit from more uh, hands-on experience with this kind of regression modeling that we've been talking about uh, last time and we'll be talking about for a few more uh, classes still. Um, so what I've done is I've put together a small homework assignment. Um, you will find this on Canvas. Uh, I can also share kind of what this is like with you quickly. Let's see. Sorry. Do you see this? Yep. 
Okay, yeah, so you'll find this in Canvas. Uh, it's a Google, it's a link to this Google doc where I describe uh, what I'm having in mind here. So what I've done is I've taken two actual data sets. So you'll see these two exercises. There's two parts to the assignment. I've taken two actual data sets from two research studies, the real data sets from real research studies. Um, and you could read more about the studies in these papers that I reference here, uh, the actual studies. And what I'd like you to do is in some way replicate some of the analyses that have been done in these studies, hands-on using your favorite statistical analysis software. I use R myself, I'm happy to uh, help you debug things if you're using R, because I know a little bit about how to do that. If you're using something else, you're welcome to do that. There's no requirement that you use R, but you're maybe more on your own. So I, I don't know enough about other software to help you. Uh, you, but you're welcome to use anything you want. So you'll see here some description of the data sets. And the reason why I put this in a Google Drive rather than a, on Canvas is because I also shared the, the CSV files with the raw data and whatnot. So you'll find all of that in the same place. Uh, and there's some description of what the data is and some research questions that I uh, would like you to answer using some form of linear regression on those two data sets for these two exercises, okay? Uh, and you can report back uh, in whatever format you want. You can report like uh, a computational notebook style or a markdown annotated uh, thing or uh, a Word document or whatever you want, whatever you're comfortable with, it doesn't matter, but just so report back on um, how you arrived at the answers you've arrived at. So answers to these specific research questions here. Um, I prefer if you do this in pairs. So I encourage you to, to team up to do this. It's I think more useful for you to learn from each other. And it's also easier for me to grade if I only have half as many to grade. So I, I, I prefer that you do that over doing things individually, but you're welcome to do things individually if you prefer. Um, remember there's also uh, Nadia in the class who is taking the class remotely because she is in an incompatible time zone. So uh, she's on the Slack channel. You could, you could talk to her and pair up with her for the assignment if you want uh, and so on. But she's not in class right now. Okay, any questions on any of these research project and or um, homework? Did you say when the homework was due? Oh, yes. So um, I uh, initially, the Canvas assignment is set for next week, Thursday, end of day. But, um, you know, I, I don't really mind if you submit it earlier or later. Um, I think the two exercises are small enough that they should only take you a few hours, maybe two, three hours of work for both of them combined, I think. Um, this assuming that you're maybe also somewhat new to R or whatever you end up using. So I, I think they're relatively straightforward because I give you all the data. You just have to load it in whatever software you're using and uh, and run some analysis. Um, but you know, if you need more time, just let me know. I'm I'm happy with that. The original plan was to have this due a week from today, end of day, next week, Thursday. But let me know if you want to make different arrangements. Okay. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, yes. The, the final thing I promised uh, a sign up sheet for presentations for the remaining uh, meetings we have left this semester. I'm still working on that. I'm still working on putting together the actual papers that I'd like us to discuss uh, in the remainder of the semester. So you know, hopefully, I'll get that out later tonight or something to, for you to sign up. Um, so I'll, I'll do that as soon as I can. I just haven't, haven't done that yet. So that's the remaining administrative thing. Okay, so now back to main content. So let's pick up the discussion where we left off. And remember, we started talking about this simple linear regression example. We have a bunch of points 
And we estimate this model uh, y as a function of x, which means we're learning these two coefficients, one for slope and one for intercept. And this here on the screen is the example of the R output that you would get when doing this. The output for whatever uh, favorite statistical software you want to use is probably similar. Uh, it will contain all of these components that are maybe just formatted in a different way. Okay, This is where we left off. And we talked about how this wasn't maybe super realistic because it only included two variables. So we talked, we left off kind of talking about how we could extend this analysis by incorporating additional predictors in this. Um, and this was discussing the example of the advertising budgets and the relationship between advertising on TV, radio, and newspapers on the one hand and amount of sales of whatever product you're advertising on the other hand. That was the example data set we were talking about. Uh, and I guess we left off with this million dollar idea that you can interpret these coefficients that you're estimating for your regression um, as the effect of the uh, independent variable on the dependent variable holding all other predictors fixed. This was the million dollar idea that holding all other predictors fixed. And this was the million dollar idea because it got you sort of closer to thinking about causal relationships in this way. Like, to the extent you're able to measure these plausible alternative explanations as additional independent variables or predictors that you can include in your model, then this framework of, of analyzing data allows you to get closer to making these kind of causal, uh, establishing these kinds of this kind of causal relationships because you're effectively excluding the these other alternative effects from consideration. Okay, so this is sort of where we left off. This is just a summary to catch you up. Uh, and I guess we saw that um, the outcome of modeling these things jointly can be different, very different. <clears throat> excuse me, from the outcome of modeling these things bivariately, individually, for every pair of independent and outcome variables. And we saw how the newspaper effect went away when we modeled these things jointly compared to when we modeled them individually. Okay. This is something we left off with, uh, last time. Okay, and I guess the last thing we talked about was uh, interaction effects, right? So like how, uh, what was the term? There was some M word for this. What was the M word? Moderator. Yes, moderators, right. So like interaction effects allow you to model, to reason about moderators. There were these two kinds of um, important concepts in uh, causal relationships, moderators and mediators. This idea of interaction terms in a regression model, interaction effects, allows you to model moderators. Okay. So let's look at an example. This is, I think, where we, um, we stopped. So here's the example. So let's say we are um, modeling the relationship between um, credit card balance like how much money you owe on your credit card. Okay, so that's the outcome variable here. As a function of income and student status, whether or not you're a student. Now this is, example is interesting for a number of reasons. One is because it's a sort of multivariate analysis. We're modeling these things jointly. We're not studying say the correlation between income and credit card balance separately from the correlation between being a student and credit card balance, we're modeling them jointly, that's one. The second reason why this is interesting is because we're combining a numerical variable, which is income, with a categorical variable, a factor, if you will, which is the student status. Okay, so here I'm representing student status as just a, a flag, a Boolean flag, a binary variable. Uh, it's either one or zero, something like this. You're either uh, a student or you're not a student. So it's only two possible values. Okay, so we haven't seen examples of uh, 
modeling jointly numerical and categorical variables yet, I think. So that's why this uh, is a second reason why this example is interesting. So here's what the regression equation might look like. A balance is a function of income with some slope. Um, and um, there's this student, this binary student variable with some other slope. So the beta one is the income slope. I'm calling beta two the student binary variable or dummy variable is the other term these are uh, referred to. If you hear dummy variable, it just refers to these flags. Um, okay, beta two is the coefficient for this dummy student variable, not dummy variable, not dummy student. Um, and uh, beta zero is the intercept. Okay, so you can see hopefully why uh, this equation looks like this, right? So, you know, if the student variable takes only one of two possible values, one or zero, then that term multiplying it by beta two is either beta two or zero, depending on if the person is a student or not. Uh, and that's what the equation, so regression equation looks like. So effectively, um, I can fold that intercept term into these beta two coefficients, right? Uh, and this becomes, um, a function of income with this fixed beta one slope and two different intercepts, depending on whether the person is a student or not, okay? So, so far there's no interaction here. I'm sort of just modeling these things independently, okay? Like income and being a student modeled independently. There's no interaction between them. So what this results in is effectively two parallel lines, right? That's what I'm modeling here. Right. Why are they parallel? Because the slope, right, the thing um, in front of income, which is the variable on the x-axis, the slope is constant, is beta one, regardless of whether or not the person is a student. Okay, so therefore, because the slope is constant, the lines are parallel. That's how this works. Okay, so without any interaction term, I am effectively fitting two parallel lines to this data, one for students and one for not students. Okay? The only difference is effectively the amount of, uh, say, starting uh, balance on their credit cards. Okay? That's what you see here. So different intercepts, but the same slope. So now, you could argue, let's see, could you argue that this is an unrealistic model? It's, it's overly simplistic. Like why, why might student and income interact and how? I mean, yes, you could argue that. I can imagine a universe where if you modeled these individually uh, just by income and you, you made two models one for students and one for not students, you could get different slopes. This sort of forces them to have the same slope. Whereas, you know, income might have a different impact on your credit card debt if you're a student than it does if you're not. It... Right, so, okay, good point. So two good points in there. One is uh, income might have a different effect on your credit card balance, depending on whether you're a student or not. That is a good point. Uh, and that's not something we considered in the specification of our model. The other point was I could model them separately. Um, so effectively you'd be dividing up the data, right? You'd be splitting up your data into students and non-students and just modeling this for, for each group. Yes, that's what I was picturing. So let's see, is there any, any reason why we might prefer a joint model over that flavor. I don't know. <laughs> I leave this as homework. Anybody have any ideas? Well, if your research question has something to do with um, whether or not being a student impacts your credit card debt, it might be good to look at them both. Yeah, so I think it's, it's likely that your 
a research question actually involves studying the interaction between those that that would be a more interesting research question you probably want to study how um income moderates um or how how being a student moderates the relationship between income and credit card balance rather okay so i think it's a you, you're right that depends on the research question and, and probably the kinds of research questions that are more interesting may require this joint model as opposed to so separate models uh that's one reason i could think of at least another one but um i'll let you think about this uh, as, as homework and we could talk more about this next time I'll, I'll bring this back so let me show you what a model where we're explicitly incorporating that interaction might look like so here what i've done is uh, the, the first half of this is the same as before but the second half here i'm saying so if you're not a student then you know nothing nothing changes but if you are a student then um the um coefficient the coefficient there uh, that determines the effect of being a student on the credit card balance depends also on income as a function of income okay so effectively i've just sort of incorporated uh, instead of having this fixed beta 2 coefficient i'm making that coefficient be a function of income right so that takes a form like the one you see here okay, so that's that's all that i've changed and now i'm introducing this dependency between um income so rather this moderating effect of um income on am i saying that right moderating is that the effect of whether being a student moderating the effect of income whether you're so you could do this in both ways i guess you could interpret this in both ways you could interpret this as how being a student moderates the effect of income on credit card balance which is probably the one you care about. Or you could also do this the other way around. And that would be how income moderates the effect of being a student on credit card balance. All right, so I, th I think you could, so it's all a matter of interpretation, like which, which of these coefficients you interpret and, and how you interpret them um, but i think effectively you could do both with the same formulation here um, okay so when i'm estimating this model now what you will end up seeing is that we still have different intercepts like we used to before but we also have different slopes right so um, we have this um, beta one slope if you're not a student and we have this um, beta one plus beta three slope, if you are a student. Okay, so effectively, uh, I'm allowing here for the possibility that changes in income may affect the credit card balance of students and non-students differently, okay, which is maybe a more realistic assumption. Uh, and this is something that sort of comes up often in all kinds of um, modeling exercises, um, either because of a known moderator that you need to control for, right? So if, if there's some, I don't know, theory that you start from or prior work or whatever evidence that so suggests this moderator exists, you probably want to, you know, you probably need to incorporate that in your analysis, right? Because you want to be able to separate its effects from the effects of the variable you care about. Um, or it could be part of your research question. You could be specifically interested in sort of discovering and modeling this interaction. Like, but either way, this is something that comes up very, very often. So you'll find this, um, you'll find this very useful, I'm sure. Um, regardless of, by the way, regardless of the type of model that you're specifying. So here we're specifying a simple linear regression model, simple linear regression model. 
this the same idea of interaction terms and interaction effects um, carries over to any kind of model, right? Be it um, a generalized model or whatever logistic uh, regression model, whatever it might be, right? This idea of interaction carries over to all of those as well. Okay, so here's a few things to kind of keep in mind and pay attention to as you're doing all of this. So what happens if the data themselves are not linear, but you're using a linear model, right? So we only discussed linear models. What if the relationship is just not linear? Like, what do you do then? You can add a non-linear term to the linear model. Yeah, so you can, you, you can in fact extend this linear modeling framework to also accommodate for the possibility, the existence of non-linear relationships. Um, ultimately, this is all a polynomial of whatever degree. So you can, you can make this as complex as you want. So you could do that. Um, here's how you might detect that um, something like this is happening um, and that you may wanna do something to address this. So um, all of these models, um, talking about linear regression models here, all of these models have some underlying assumptions um, about the distribution of things, about how things behave and, and whatnot. Um, and take a look at any of the readings I've posted, these introductory statistics textbooks and whatnot that I've posted, uh, they go, all go into depth about you know, what these assumptions are and why they're so, uh, and so on. So uh, we're not gonna cover that here, but su it suffices to uh, say that they all have some assumptions that need to hold in order for these models to be valid to be therefore usable and interpretable. So um, to detect violations of uh, these assumptions, you have access to all kinds of diagnostics that you can run on, on these models. Uh, and for example, um, this is one of the very commonly used ones. So remember, we talked about residuals. Does anybody remember what the residuals were? in this context of a regression model? What were the residuals? It's essentially the error at each point. Right. Between, yeah, the fitted line and the actual point. Right, right. So whatever, uh, you know, the model is just an approximation. So whatever uh, is remaining, the error, is it's called the residuals. So here I'm plotting the residuals on the y-axis as a function of the fitted values on the x axis. Okay, so what do you, well, I guess if the slide says this. So what you expect to see here, like if, you're, if your model is reasonable, what you expect to see in a plot like this is that the residuals are just sort of randomly distributed. There's so no discernible pattern in them. Right. Why is that? It indicates that any disparity between a data point and the fitted line is due to randomness and not an additional pattern in the data. Yeah, saying. right. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah. So, you know, Ideally, you would want your model to be an accurate, as, as accurate as possible, a representation of your data. And um, the, the kinds of errors you, you want to see, right? Obviously, the, no model will be a perfect representation of the data uh, because the model is, by definition, a simplification of the data. Uh, but what you'd like to see is that you've captured the main pa patterns, if any, that were present in the data with your model, right? And if you see something like this, okay, um, for this particular example, that indicates that there was some underlying pattern in the data 
that your model did not at all capture, right? So, you know, you just don't know, you cannot trust your model therefore, because it's sort of not at all accurately capturing the, the, the structure of the data and the relationship that exists there. So these kind of residuals versus fitted plots are things that you get for free in, in any statistics uh, software. Um, in R, uh, it's just a matter of using the plot function. You use call the plot function with the model object as a, uh, an argument, and you get uh, this and other diagnostic plots like, uh, like this. We'll see more in a minute. Um, yeah, and so this would tell you that there's some relationship in the data that you haven't yet captured with your model. And, and that in turn will tell you that you probably want to go back and refine your model. Okay. Um, in this case, this would indicate a nonlinear relationship. Uh, and you can, you can clearly see that if you just look at the scatter plots um, on the left-hand side. Okay. So um, key point here is inspect, look at these um, plots of residuals because they tell you something about how much you can trust the model you've just estimated. Uh, and there's some underlying assumption here that for this, for this to be a valid, reasonable model, you should expect to see these be, uh, have no discernible pattern in the residuals. You just want to see some random errors there, not, not clear uh, patterns. Um, so here's what this would look like. Uh, for a more reasonable model, right? So here I'm showing you a, a much more linear relationship between those points on the left-hand side. And I'm showing you how the corresponding residuals versus fitted plot on the right-hand side captures um, or rather reflects that this is a much better model than the one we had a, a minute ago. Because here, arguably, uh, there is no discernible pattern. Um, the, the points are just the, the circles there. You see the dots you see on the, on the plot. And um, that red line is just a smooth, a smooth out version of the uh, point cloud. It's useful to kind of visually see if there's some clear pattern going in, in, in one direction or another. And this one here isn't really, uh, you know, there's a little bit of pattern, but there's always a little bit of pattern. It's not, it's not too offensive, right? It's um, so more or less, um, fluctuating around zero. So that's sort of, that's what you hope to see with, with, with these kind of uh, plots. Okay, so that's one. One potential problem to always keep in mind is that real data is you know, often uh, indicative or includes more complex than linear relationships between variables. Like this is just an approximation, it's a simplification. Linear relationships are but a simplification. Um, Here's a cool thing. So um, turns out actually, so you'd ask, you know, who cares? Why does this matter? Well, here's one reason why this matters. Um, so these are the same two examples from, I don't know, the last couple of slides. What, I, uh, what I've done is I've estimated these uh, regression models for each of these sets of points. And note how in both cases, the, estimated values of the coefficients, the slope and the intercept, as well as this R squared value that's indicative of how well the data fits this model, the model fits the data. Okay. These are identical up to some decimal. Okay. So note how um, this can all be very, very misleading. Like here we have very clearly distinct patterns and relationships in the data that result in literally identical models as far as the estimated coefficients and the goodness of fit values would tell you, okay? So, you know, I, the bigger point is, and I, I'm sure you've heard this before with anything that has to do with machine learning, uh, garbage in, garbage out, right? The responsibility is on you, the researcher, the user of these methods to, um, use them properly and interpret them correctly and so on. The method itself will always produce something, right? You throw in some data and it produces some model as an output, like it learns some coefficients, right? Whether those mean anything or not, that's on you. That's not on the, on the method, right? Or on the software you're using. So you know, th this is a good example of how you could 
um, draw very different conclusions um, if you actually knew what the true nature of this relationship was. But the model itself does not reflect that at all. Um, okay, here's another example uh, to, to illustrate this idea of, of dealing with nonlinearity again. Um, we have a data set of uh, fuel consumption uh, measured in miles per gallon for engines or cars versus uh, the horsepower uh, of these engines. So, um, and what I've done is, so I've on the, on the left-hand side, I have estimated a linear regression modeling the fuel consumption as a function of horsepower okay, directly, linearly. Um, and this is the corresponding residual plot for that model. Okay, so what does this tell you? It tells you that, you know, that there appears to be a discernible pattern in the residuals, right? This is not sort of randomly distributed residuals. There appears to be some discernible pattern. So, you know, by inspecting this plot, you would conclude that um, you've sort of missed some important uh, dimension relationship in your data and you, you go back and you uh, refine your model. So what I've done that on the right hand side uh, and what I've done is I have included a quadratic term um, there. So instead of modeling um, fuel consumption linearly as a function of horsepower, I am also including this quadratic uh, term for horsepower, right? So it's, it becomes a quadratic relationship. It's not linear anymore, right? So uh, fuel consumption varies quadratically with horsepower rather than linearly. Uh, and you could see how this refinement results in a much better model, right? Because now there's much less discernible pattern in these residuals, okay? Um, we, we just, we just talked about this. I don't, I don't remember what this was about, but we talked about this just, uh, just a minute ago. So I'll skip this. Um, another one still, right? So there's a laundry list of these problems. Um, another one still is that the, um, error terms should um, not be correlated temporally. That's another one of these assumptions of these models. In other words, that the observations are independent of each other. Um, so what I'm showing you as examples is three artificial data sets that have been created to illustrate this particular point. Um, they have been created so that in the top example, there is no uh, relationship, no correlation between consecutive data points. When I randomly created these, uh, these data points, uh, this data set. Uh, and you can see how um, going from the top to the bottom, to, uh, the other two, in the other two plots, I am sort of artificially creating this increasingly stronger correlation between consecutive data points as I'm creating this, uh, this artificial data set. So, uh, and there's a very, there's a sort of moderate correlation in the middle plot and a strong correlation in the, in the bottom one in the, in the original data set that I'm modeling. So this happens a lot with time series data. Uh, and it's actually, you know, we're gonna have another discussion uh, altogether about uh, time series analysis and, and models for uh, capturing time dependent variables uh, on, on a different day. But for, for now, um, just um, I, I'm using this as an example to illustrate how, you know, a regression, a linear regression model like the ones we've been discussing is probably an inappropriate choice for modeling temporally dependent data. Um, and so what happens is, right? So you would say, why, why would you care? How, why does this matter at all? So um, what matters, why this matters, the effect of this is that um, the standard errors 
of the coefficients as estimated from these models um, tend to be lower than they ought to be when these variables are so temporally dependent. Okay, so what does that mean? That means that we talked about two types of errors that could creep up, not just with regression models, but with all kinds of quantitative analyses. We talked about type one versus type two errors. Does anybody remember what each of those was? What was type one and what was type two? Type one is that if uh, there was no significant uh, difference, but you think there is. Right, so false positive, falsely detecting a relationship yeah. when there shouldn't have been one. Yeah, and type two is the opposite. There is no, uh, there is relationship, but you didn't detect one. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah. So here, if um, I um, am getting standard errors of these coefficients that are much smaller in the, uh, as estimated than they are in reality, what would I conclude and what type of error would I be doing? Would I be introducing type here? One? Type one, yes, correct. So I, be, if these standard errors tend to be lower than they should be, then I am more likely to um, conclude that those coefficients are statistically significantly different from zero. And therefore I am uh, going to conclude that there is a, a relationship an association between that variable corresponding to that coefficient and the outcome, right? Right. So I would say, you know, these two things are related would be the conclusion of my study. And that would be incorrect. I would be falsely detecting this relationship when there shouldn't have been one. Okay, so this is, you know, um, one scenario in which that could happen, right? If you're wrongly using these linear models as described so far to model time series data. Okay. Um, here's another one still. There's a bunch of these. Um, this one, so another one of these assumptions of these models is that the variance of the error terms is constant. So this is related to the previous point. Here we're looking at the same plots that we looked at earlier, the plots of residuals versus fitted values, okay? Uh, and as before, what you want to see is sort of uh, not any discernible patterns in these residuals, right? So um, in the example on the left-hand side, you see that even though there is maybe, um, so they're kind of both uh, fluctuating, sorry, um, the, the, the residuals are fluctuating around the uh, horizontal line uh, across the entire range, um, which is maybe fine, but there's this very clearly discernible pattern, right? Uh, in that the vari there's more variance in these residuals in the error terms as the uh, value of the response variable increases. Okay, so you see this funnel shape. Okay. Um, and so th this is, there's a technical term for this. It's always a mouthful to pronounce. Um, it's called heteroscedasticity. I'll say that three times uh, quickly, one after the other. So uh, anyway, so whenever you see this technical term, uh, know what that means. It means exactly this. It means that you, um, you're dealing with a scenario like the one on the left-hand side, yeah, that the uh, variance in the residuals in these error terms is not constant across the entire range. So what that tells you is, uh, again, that your, um, um, 
to not capturing the real, uh, your, your linear model is too simplistic. You're not capturing the relationship between those variables accurately. So here's a transformation, like what, what do you do in these cases? The, the common fix to this potential problem is to transform your predictor variables. Okay. So in the example that you have in front of you here, I have transformed the, uh, the variables by logging them. Okay, so the, the log transformation effectively compresses that range. So now the distance between these uh, extremely high values becomes more compressed. That's what the log does. Okay, and you can see how that was actually a use. Uh, so here's the response has been logged. Uh, instead of modeling y as a function of x, I'm modeling the log of y as a function of x. Okay, uh, you can see how this transformation results in a much better behaved plot of residuals versus fitted, and therefore a much more reasonable and valid model. Okay. So this is just cheating to fit a log curve using linear regression. Uh huh. That's, that's neat. Yeah, this in the same way that I was cheating earlier by including a quadratic term to model a quadratic regression. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It, but so, yes, it's cheating, but that means I can now correctly and rightfully use an existing modeling framework to um, analyze my particular data. Right. right. In, in linear algebra, it's not called cheating. It's called changing your bases. So, and it's a perfectly reasonable thing to do, but I like that. Mm -hmm. You know, so data science, um, and I, you know, I can't believe I'm saying this on camera, but it's all, it's all about cheating. Okay. Um, I may have told this bad joke that I, uh, I don't think resonated much, uh, I don't know, a couple of lectures ago about, um, you know, you can come up with whatever answer you, um, the, the reader wants, right, by analyzing data in, in different ways. You know, so th this is uh, another example of, of, of that. And we've seen many examples of that, I think, in previous lectures of how you can um, arrive at very different conclusions by analyzing the same data just in sort of slightly different ways. Um, okay, so like, wh why do you why do you care about this? Why why does this matter? Like one reason why this matters, why heteroscedasticity as a problem matters, is because it tends to, uh, similarly as before, it tends to produce p values that are smaller than they should be. In other words, it tends to underestimate the standard errors relative to what they should be. So it's the same um, same effect as the previous problem we talked about. Okay, so here you would incorrect, you would potentially incorrectly detect relationships between variables when there shouldn't have been any. It's another one of these uh, type one errors. Okay. Okay. Um, so that was heteroscedasticity. There's a there's more uh, more potential problems. Here's another potential problem. This has to do with outliers. Um, check out the two example data sets on the top row. Okay. Look how um, uh, there are, in each of the two data sets on the top row, there are two very clear outliers. Okay. Um, the blue line, by the way, it's, this is interesting. Actually, do I have that here? Yeah, I have that here. So let me start with this. This is more interesting. So note how both of these new data sets that I've just introduced not only have, again, so not only have the same uh, coefficient estimates between them, and so therefore the same regression line. In fact, you see that blue line there on the scatter plots. That is the estimated regression line for each of the two data sets. So not only do they have the same 
estimated regression line and goodness of fit values for these linear models. But also they have the same regression line and goodness of fit values as the previous two data sets that we talked about a few minutes ago. Okay, so remember the, the, the you know the nice linear one that is maybe the for which the linear regression line is, is a good representation, right? All of these four, and we had the quadratic one as well, all of these four data sets have literally the same regression lines and goodness of fit values. They've been created for the specific purpose. They, they go by a name, they are called Anscombe, Anscombe's Quartet. So it's a famous example of um, how easily it is to be misled by, uh, uh, by data. So like, why is this, why is this interesting? So look how, look how the relationship, right? So let's look at the left-hand side uh, one, the first, the first data set. Like arguably there, um, the estimated regression line, like, surely it's not ideal, but it's not the worst representation of that data set, right? So like the, you know, Excluding this one outlier, the regression line would probably pass perfectly through those uh, other points you see there drawn. Okay, uh, but the one that's been estimated is you know still somewhat close. That is absolutely not the case with the example on the right hand side. Check that out. Right, so an example on the right hand side, the except for this one outlier, there is probably there should be probably a perfectly vertical line passing through those points. Okay, so the relationship there is very, very different in reality than it has been estimated for the simple linear regression. You see that? Okay, so how can we tell, right? How do we know, right? So, you know, it's easy to diagnose this in these simple examples where you have these bivariate relationships for which you can just uh, look at scatter plots and whatnot. It's easy to do that here, but often we have you know, much more complex multivariate models um, with all kinds of uh, covariates and so on. So there, there the sort of visual uh, interpretation of scatter plots uh, falls apart quickly. You can't, you can't scale this uh, anymore. So that's where these diagnostic plots come in again, right? I, I keep talking about this. So, Look how, in both cases, the, the same diagnostic plot that we've um, discussed so far, this plot of residuals versus fitted, um, in both cases, that would indicate that something is wrong is, is going on, right? Because what you want to see in these plots is no discernible pattern in the residuals, right? And you, know, you can clearly see, I hope, from these examples that there's absolutely some discernible pattern in the residuals here. Um, in fact, there is yet another kind of diagnostic plot. Um, this one is called residuals versus leverage. Um, the, uh, I won't go into what leverage means specifically, but this is discussed in, in sufficient detail in some of the readings. So just check out the, the textbooks about this. Uh, what exactly is the definition of this leverage measure and so on? The idea here, though, is that by visually inspecting these diagnostic plots, you can identify points um, in your input data that have high leverage, meaning that should you remove them from the data and re-estimate that linear regression model, you would uh, obtain a very different line. Right, that means the points have high leverage on the outcome, right? Because if you remove them, it changes the nature of the relationship dramatically. So note how, um, in the example of the left hand side, in the left hand side example, uh, that outlier you see there, which um, is labeled as point number three in the in the bottom residuals versus leverage plot. It's, it's that top outlying point in the top scatter plot. Okay. Note how uh, that point um, is, according to this measure of leverage, 
uh, flag that's having high leverage because it sits outside of some range that is considered to be normal. You could, you could read more about this in the textbook. Um, and you know you would you would conclude from this that you know that's a point worth investigating, right? So what does that mean? Like, does it mean you know? Is it so? First of all, like the kinds of questions you would ask yourself when identifying points like these are are typically are typically two. One is so. What what do you do with this? One is do I remove that point from consideration and from modeling uh, because I have some reason to suspect that it has either been you know incorrectly measured or there's uh, uh not uh, representative or or whatever there's some reason to do that right so do you remove it or do you go back and refine your model to better account for it these are the two options uh, you remove the point and then your model uh, as specified hopefully behaves better or you change your model specification to accommodate the existence of that point without removing it. these are the, the options right so these kinds of diagnostics help you make that determination. Um, and the idea here, uh, the, the one other idea worth mentioning is that, uh, so you, you'll hear this discussion of outliers and we've removed outliers. You'll, you'll see lots of papers talking about how we removed outliers and whatnot. Uh, and that's so typically a good thing. But like what I want you to remember is that outliers per se are not a bad thing. It's only outliers with high leverage that are potentially a bad thing. Okay, so um, I don't know that I have an example uh, here to show you, but so imagine the following: imagine that um, in the top left example, where you see those points sort of aligning pretty well with the regression, the blue regression line. Imagine that my outlier there uh, was sitting on the same regression line, but just far away to the right somewhere. Okay, so that point is technically still an outlier, is very, very far from the range of values of all the other ones, but it has little to no leverage, meaning that if I remove it, the regression line, the new regression line that I would estimate after removing it would be indistinguishable, right? Because by construction, I've placed that point literally on the regression line uh, of the other ones, right? So that is a harmless, arguably, outlier because it doesn't change and it doesn't do anything bad, right? The only bad outliers are the ones with high leverage. That makes sense? Because those would dramatically change the nature of the relationship as estimated, okay? So just remember this one thing uh, that you know, outliers aren't the same as high leverage points, but high leverage points usually come from among outliers, right? So some outliers are high leverage points, but not all outliers are high leverage points, okay? Okay, um, we talked about this. Oh yeah, so this is a cool one. I think Kyle, you mentioned this last time. I don't know if Kyle's still around. Uh, you, you asked about uh, collinearity last time. So here's a data set to, that illustrates this well. Um, I have um, two variables here, x1 and x2, okay, that are identical. You see that in the example? The values for all of these points are identical between the two variables, x1 and x2, by construction. That's how I created them. Okay, and the uh, I'm, I'm trying to um, or sorry, the the y value here is the sum of these two variables. Okay, so you know six plus six equals twelve, six and a half plus six and a half equals thirteen, and so on. Okay, so I've artificially constructed this data set such that x1 and x2 are exactly the same variable and the outcome variable y is perfectly modeled as the sum of the two. There's no, uh, there are no residuals here. There's no error term, okay? So now what's the problem with this, you're asking? 
right, so what would be the model that I would specify would be uh, y equals beta zero plus beta one times x one plus beta two times x two. That makes sense. So now note how any of these other specifications are also true. Y can also be specified as two times X one without considering X two at all. Okay, so, you, or you could say two times X one plus zero times X two. Okay. Or it could be three times X one minus X two or whatever you want, right? There's infinitely many of these. So now, if, you know, essentially, if you have a, a model, right, uh, y equals beta zero plus beta one x one plus beta two x two, and you're asking um, the software to estimate these coefficients, right, you can see how it'd be very confused because you wouldn't know which one of these to pick. They're all equally valid, they're all equally good representations of that relationship. That makes sense. But this is called collinearity. Um, so here, in this case, the two um, predictor variables x1 and x2 are collinear. Uh, and the model just cannot distinguish between these many nearly equally plausible lines, uh, sort of linear combinations of these collinear variables, right? Uh, and what happens is this can result in very large standard errors on the coefficients and even coefficient signs that don't make any sense. Like, what kind of error is this? A two error? Why? Because you're less likely to detect a significant difference. Right. So large standard errors means large p-values, which in turn means um, uh, inability to reject the null hypothesis that that coefficient estimate is uh, different from zero, right? So we just, um, this would be a false negative, right? There's probably a relationship there, but we can't detect it. We would incorrectly conclude that there isn't one there just because we can't, we can't actually, uh, narrow down the, this, this search here uh, well enough. So uh, there's uh, different ways in which you can uh, evaluate whether collinearity is affecting your model or not. Um, if you're using R, there's a function called the, so there's probably an equivalent of this in, in any statistical package you're using. Um, the textbook that I shared with you, or the chapter from the textbook, goes into more detail about so how exactly this variance inflation factor is computed and what it, what it represents. Um, but there's this notion of uh, a measure uh, called a variance inflation factor, um, which you can compute and interpret as indicative of multicollinearity or not. Uh, so the, you know, this, this is one simple test that you could do to determine whether um, you have uh, this problem of affecting your model or not. Uh, effectively, you're looking for correlation, high correlation between uh, predictor variables, high pairwise correlations between predictor variables. Um, they needn't always be pairwise, or um, but also, so this is a little bit more subtle than this. So just take a look at the readings again. I, I, I don't have enough time to like go into more detail than this, but this is one one simple way of diagnosing whether that is actually a problem or not. There are other ways, it's not the only way, but it's one, one simple way. Um, okay, so let's, I guess, let me pause for a second here and see if, if any of you have any questions about any of what we discussed so far.
Okay, hearing none, then I invite you to think about the following. So let's, we have about 10 minutes. So let's spend, I don't know, a, a few minutes uh, thinking about this. You, you can do this in, in breakouts again. So here are um, the questions that I started last lecture with. Right? A set of questions that uh, come up often during quantitative data analysis, uh, empirical research using quantitative data analysis. Um, and I uh, formulated these questions in the context of this uh, advertising uh, scenario and an example that we ran with uh, throughout, uh, but they have equivalence in, in research that you would do. So now, after you've seen all of these uh, examples of how you might specify and interpret linear regression models, I'd like you to reflect on these questions again and think about how you might use linear regression modeling, so sort of how, how would you do this, um, to answer questions like these. For example, you know, literally these ones here uh, for our running example. Okay, so how about, how about we do, I don't know, five minutes to discuss these quickly uh, in groups and then we come back and see what you came up with. Does that work? So how about I do two breakout rooms and I assign you and I'm opening the rooms and we come back in about five minutes. Yay. We're back. So how do we do it? I guess I am not clear about the question. Is there, are you asking us to talk about the plan of conducting this research or? No, much more specifically, how would you use a regression model, if at all, to answer a question like this or, or specifically this? So how, how would you use a regression model to determine if there's a relationship between advertising budget and sales. I guess the easiest way is just a uh, regression, regress their own, I'm not sure it's request their own advertising budget or advertising budget on sale. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure which one is the, the term I'm looking for, but I want to put sales as Y axis and uh, advertising budget as X axis. Yeah, so the, the y-axis is the regress y on x is the terminology. Oh, okay. So regress their own advertising budget. But advertising budget is sort of three advertising budgets, right? It's TV, radio, and newspaper. So put each one as an independent variable. So mm -hmm. three variables in total. Mm -hmm. And how would you conclude if there's a relationship or not? If any variables are significantly correlated with the sales. I mean, the coefficients are significantly different from zero. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, good. And how, how strong is the relationship, say, uh, between one of these and sales? How would you answer that? What would you look at? The scale of the coefficient and the, the, the what, what's, what's called confidence interval or the, the p-value. Mm -hmm. So you're right, you would look at the value of the coefficient, for example, to describe the strength of that relationship. How do we interpret that? Let's see, someone, someone else. Um, I'm seeing Simon there wearing a mask, so I'm gonna pick on him. Sorry. Um... Qu question is, how do I interpret those coefficients? Um... You mean that like the beta one, beta two, yes, beta three? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, um, I guess it's like how strong that independent variable is related to the sales. Um, but read that for me in English. Um, Let's Sorry, going, I'm not sure. Yeah. Going left to right, Sam. 
Uh, okay. Um, how strong is the relationship? Uh, so I'm I'm actually not very sure about this. Um, so our group discussed it, and um, um, uh, most of us think that um, how strong we um, we look at the coefficient, and if the coefficient um, is large, uh, then that means a large, basically a large effect um, of that uh, term on the on the outcome. Uh, can you can you quantify it? Can you say that in English? Uh, um, do you mean maybe like interpreting one of the coefficient? Yes. Okay, sure, yeah. Uh, so for example, if it's, I don't know, if it's something like the cells, um, if it's um, if it's the coefficient for, um, I don't know, for the TV act advertising budget is, let's say a hundred and, and the TV advertising budget is measured in, I don't know, dollars, maybe mm -hmm. sales also in dollars, that, that means that, um, a, a, any that means that every one additional uh, dollar spent on the um, TV advertising budget contributes to or well it's um, it's correlated or it's uh, associated with an uh, additional a hundred dollars in in sales on on average controlling for uh, or else yeah yeah thank you that's that's exactly right right so uh, it, every one unit increase in the TV budget corresponds to a one hundred dollar increase in sales, holding all the other variables fixed. That's exactly right, right? So um, that's how you would do this. Um, if, if, say, we're comparing the three media, TV, radio, and uh, newspapers, how would we, and this is the last one because we're out of time. I don't want to keep you too long. How would we answer the third question there? Like, which media contribute the most to, to sales? How would we answer that? Uh, each medium ends up with its own coefficient that you could look at and compare to the other coefficients, just if you model them all at once. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, great. So uh, let, let me do just one more. The last one, uh, like, is there any synergy among these advertising media? In, in other words, um, do you, right, so how would you answer something like this? What, what does that sort of suggest to you as a modeling approach? Is there any synergy between TV and radio, for example? Is that the collinearity stuff you were just talking about? That would be the interaction stuff that I was talking about. Hmm. So, for example, if you know, do I get more return on my TV advertising budget in terms of sales if I spend a little bit more on radio, also in parallel? Right. So is there some synergy like that? Right? Does it help if I have this more coordinated campaign uh, spending on, on radio and TV at the same time? Does that, does that change the nature of the relationship between the TV spend expenditure and, and sales? Right? If, I, if I vary the radio expenditure, that would be an, an example of an interaction term, interaction effect. OK, so um, this is it for today. Uh, again, take a look at the quantitative analysis homework. It should be straightforward, but I think really, really useful if you haven't done this at all, or if you haven't done this in a while, just to remind yourselves how all of this stuff works in, um, in I don't know, your favorite programming language or statistics software. Uh, and if you want to talk to me about so how to do that, if you get stuck or whatever, I'm available anytime. We can find a time to meet before next class or, or whatever. We could talk over Slack or email, whatever you want. So just feel free to reach out. Think of this as an opportunity to have some extra office hours if you want. Okay. Um, if you've done this before or, or, or recently, this should be really, really uh, quick. If you haven't done this before or haven't done this recently, then it will be really useful to uh, see how you would do this uh, hands-on. All right, so that, that's it for today. I'll see you next week. Thanks a lot.